This week on Footnoting History, a failed emperor, a bankrupt priest, and a successful and yet also bankrupt composer, and how they got together to create some of the most famous chords and famous social criticism in opera history. Hello, I'm Lucy. Before I get to Lorenzo da Ponte, Mozart, and Joseph II, I'm just going to put the disclaimer at the beginning that opera in the 18th century was very, very far from a Hollywood stereotype of rich people listening to staid and stuffy music. But you don't have to take my word for that, at least until we get to the end of the episode. The 18th century opera house was a theatre of political representation and an arena for political debate. Through the mid-18th century or so, many court operas were very, very formal affairs, with ballets, set pieces, uh, written about heroes and gods, and they were fantastic. And when they disappeared, this disappearance was driven more by changes in public mood than changes in musical taste. People thought the trumpets and drums and everything were really exciting, but wanted to see something more current being enacted. Style and subject matter alike were topics of heated public debate. Uh, the Paris police in the 1740s through 60s had frequently to break up fights about opera, but that could probably be another podcast on its own. For now, suffice it to say that the 18th century opera house was a theater of political representation and an arena for political debate. The stage was often used as a forum for sensitive questions like does social class affect personal character? What about personal worth? What makes it acceptable to disobey authority? What makes men and women different? Then, as now, the personal could be very political indeed. In order for works critical of the status quo to both survive and reach a large audience, any critique needed to be indirect, avoiding outcry or even censorship. We'll come back to that in discussing the multiple versions of Don Giovanni. But first, I want to discuss a singularly uncharismatic emperor who enabled Mozart to write the thing in the first place. Joseph II, Habsburg Emperor, asked that his own epitaph should read that he failed in everything he attempted. Exhaustively educated, he took the throne in 1765. During his tenure as emperor, he granted increased legal toleration to Protestants and Jews, a big deal in the Holy Roman Empire, and attempted to limit the political and economic clout of the Catholic Church. He often appropriated funds from monasteries and convents and used them to fund public works projects. Furthermore, he established the principle of equality before the law, abolished serfdom, and radically limited the death penalty. He became known, not always affectionately, as the peasant emperor, and in the year preceding his death in 1790, he was forced to rescind many of his reforms. It's worth noting, of course, that 1790 was a much more nervous year for the monarchs of Europe than 1760 or even 1780, due largely to events in France. Both Joseph and his successor, Leopold, were brothers of Marie Antoinette, she who infamously advised the workers of France to eat cake. But to the opera. Joseph is infamous for saying that Mozart put too many notes in his operas, but these are, in fact, words that Peter Schaeffer put in the emperor's mouth in Amadeus. Do see the brilliant film, but don't believe it. What the emperor is reported to have said was, Das sind gewaltig viel Noten, lieber Mozart. Uh, those are indeed very many notes, dear Mozart, uh, in reference to the marriage of Figaro. Whether this was a comment of criticism, admiration, or just surprise is sadly not recorded. Don Giovanni was not Mozart's breakthrough. He'd been successful for ages, from his days as a wunderkind prodigy to his steady work as a career composer. But his big, bona fide, runaway hit was Le Nozze di Figaro, The Marriage of Figaro, a collaboration with Lorenzo da Ponte that premiered in Prague in 1781. Lest you think this was all buttoned up and elite, Mozart wrote in elation, and with more than a hint of smugness, to his father, here, in Prague, all talk is of Figaro and nothing else. Everyone is playing, singing, and whistling Figaro, and nothing else. There is no other opera than Figaro. Now, this successful opera was based on banned literature. 
The French playwright Beaumarchais had written, a few years previously, a trilogy of plays which were a bit like a subversive version of Upstairs Downstairs, in which a nobleman disguises himself and extracts a young woman from legal guardianship, marries her, and proceeds to make her life a living hell by being unfaithful, at which point his servants get back at him uh, by tricking him into believing that his wife is in fact the serving woman whom he wants to have sex with. All very exciting, and due to Joseph's new laws abolishing censorship in the theatre, Mozart was able to take this hot topic and turn it into an opera. Don Giovanni is, if anything, even more shocking. More on that in a minute. And both operas were written in collaboration with Lorenzo da Ponte. Da Ponte was, like Mozart, an inveterate envelope pusher, both artistically and socially, and it may have been this which led to their styles clicking so well with each other, each enhancing the other's work. Uh, the Hepburn and Tracy of 18th century opera, if you will. Da Ponte wrote for Mozart's operas the words for his characters to sing. Uh, Mozart believed that characters should sing their emotions, not rhyming couplets of an old-fashioned sort. Da Ponte said we can do rhyming couplets and have characters sing their emotions at the same time, and the results are fantastic. Da Ponte himself was a bit of an unlikely success story. Uh, he was one of three children born to a Jewish tanner in northern Italy, who converted, was baptized with his father when his father fell in love at the age of 40 with a younger woman and decided to convert to Catholicism for her sake. His sons were baptized with him and forthwith committed to seminary to receive an education. There, beginning at the age of 14, Da Ponte was educated not only in Latin literature, but at the encouragement of his teachers in Italian literature as well, and he took to this like a duck to water. He was constantly uh, selling and pawning goods in order to buy more books, uh, an irresponsible but thoroughly endearing habit. Now, although da Ponte did eventually join the priesthood, the career for which the seminary fitted him, technically speaking, uh, it soon became apparent that he was not temperamentally suited to it at all. On his departure from seminary after being ordained, he almost immediately left for Venice, which was a bit like the Las Vegas of 18th century Europe. Here, da Ponte amassed a string of debts and a string of mistresses, and eventually uh, the former forced him to leave the city with the last and most permanent of the latter, and he departed for Vienna cosmopolitan Vienna, the center of the wide-stretching Habsburg Empire. Here he got a letter of introduction to the court and eventually started working together with Mozart. The rest is history. Now to Don Giovanni. In the opening scene he is attempting to rape Donna Anna. Uh, this is interrupted by her screams for help to her fiancé, Don Ottavio, and her father, the Commendatore. In the duel that ensues, Don Giovanni kills the Commendatore, Don Anna's father, and symbolically, at least according to some, an old order. Meanwhile, Don Giovanni is being pursued by an ex-girlfriend and just possibly abandoned wife, Don Elvira, who is still in love with him. Even the fact that his servant Leporello tells to her the whole sordid truth of his history as a womanizer, she remains committed to the idea of his redemption. In one crucial episode, he interrupts the wedding of a peasant couple, Serlina and Mazetto, uh, this young couple who are very much in love. This does not tempt Don Giovanni, of course, from attempting to seduce Serlina, uh, and when that does not work, attempting to assault her. This about takes us halfway through, but Don Giovanni's actions catch up with him in the case of the murder of the Commendatore, Don Anna's father. Don Giovanni, in a fit of hubris, invites the dead Commendatore to dinner, an invitation which the latter accepts, leading to the undead Commendatore, Mozart's only zombie, taking his hand in a grip of steel and dragging him off to hell. Why is a story about an antihero so endearingly popular? Well, Bridget Brophy views Don Giovanni as an unconsciously autobiographical work, an eternal enigma, 
an unstaunchable wound in the cultural consciousness of civilization. Grand words. Her analysis, like that of Amadeus, for those of you who have seen the film, is reliant on Freud, but the opera has always bothered and haunted, as well as fascinated and charmed, its viewers. Jessica Waldoff, in Recognition in Mozart's Operas, has called Don Giovanni the most discussed, deliberated, and disputed of Mozart's operas. In one memorable production I saw, the action of the piece is quite literally set in motion when Giovanni, clad as an adventurer in a black cape, tips a statue reminiscent of Bernini's Apollo and Daphne on to the Commendatore, fatally wounding him. Way to dramatize the transition from classicism to romanticism. Although Don Giovanni, in the story that he and his valet, Leporello, tell about his exploits, is presented as a womanizer who regards blondes and brunettes, old women and young, rich and poor, skinny and plump, all alike as eventual conquests, he is viewed very differently by the other characters. Donna Anna, whom he attempts to rape, speaks of him as scum. Don Ottavio, her fiancé, is, like Anna, given very classical, traditional music, and while he believes, of course, that any would-be sexual predator is, in fact, scum, he is unable to believe that a nobleman could ever do such a thing. I think it's fair to say that Ottavio is not very bright. While many productions make him a fairly sympathetic product of his society, he can also be viewed as a much less benign agent of an oppressive patriarchal structure. Donna Elvira, another female protagonist, refers to Giovanni as her husband, they have history, clearly, and is presented both as dignified and as convinced that he is in some way redeemable. Also, both Mozart and De Ponte present her sexual desire as non-ridiculous, for which I would like to give them a feminist high five. The characters who are quickest to see through Giovanni, however, are those who are not members of the aristocracy. Giovanni's own servant, Leporello, is constantly telling his master what a terrible person he is, and Serlina and Mazetto are peasant newlyweds who give him short shrift indeed. They also sing sexy duets with each other and end the opera singing, and now we'll go home to supper. I think they're kind of great. In the middle of the opera, there's a great moment where everybody at Don Giovanni's party stops what they're doing, dancing, flirting, etc., and sings in unison, Viva la Libertà! And this, perhaps, in a nutshell, is what makes Don Giovanni more than just the sleazebag that Donna Anna says he is, more than an antihero who tries with comical failure to seduce every woman he meets, if not outright attack them. He is also an upsetter of the rules. He will have everyone dance at the same time. He will, sometimes, selectively, when it suits his purposes, acknowledge the realities of female desire in a way that many of the other male characters seem unwilling to do. And it was these features, more than his villainous qualities, which made him both dangerous and fascinating. For the Prague premiere, Don Giovanni ends the opera being pulled down by a walking, talking statue from hell, uh, who embodies in some way the retribution of his own deeds. It's a statue representing the commendatore whom he kills in the first scene, the father of Don Anna, the ideal representative of the old order. And then, bang, curtain. When the opera, having started its successful run in Prague, moved to Vienna and the center of the empire, a number of changes were made. The ending was deemed to be too ambiguous, and everyone gets a chorus at the end explaining that Don Giovanni ending up with a walking, talking statue from hell is meeting the fate of all evildoers, and he was definitely, totally, absolutely an unreservedly bad person uh, who is now being justly rewarded. Meanwhile, Cerlina and Mazzato affirm that they will get married and make honest people of each other. Donna Elvira says that she will join a convent. Leporello says that he will not become a gentleman, as he has said earlier that he would like to do, but will find a new master. And Donna Anna says to Ottavio that she would like a period to mourn her father before duly becoming his wife. In other words, the social order as it is, is reaffirmed. Don Giovanni's chaos is not allowed to prevail, and the subversive line, Viva la Libertà, was changed into Viva la Società, long live society. So where does this leave us? While the bold strokes of Joseph's reforms worked against their long-term survival, 
They were the product of an enthusiasm for critical examination of the status quo that was far from untypical. In the cities and law courts of the Habsburg Empire, open challenge of long-standing rules and privileges could cause counterproductive chaos. But on the opera stage, a lady's maid and a countess could change places in order to rebuke a domestic tyrant in The Marriage of Figaro. In Don Giovanni, Da Ponte and Mozart explore what happens when individuals defy society's expectations. The Don himself both praises freedom and practices exploitation, and the motivations and morality of all the characters are, in my opinion, not only a fascinating window onto a moment in history, but as endlessly fascinating as the music itself. This has been Footnoting History. If you like the podcast, be sure to visit our website, footnotinghistory.com, where you can find further reading suggestions related to this week's podcast. You can also like us on our Facebook page and follow us on Twitter at History Footnote. Join us next week when we'll be talking about the Kenyan Mau Mau insurgency. Until then, remember, the best stories are always in the footnotes. See you next week.